It is a great pleasure to, in introduce, Dan, to introduce Dan Mathis. So since uh, obtaining her PhD from University of Rochester in 1977, Dan has, a, has, had, a, has had a luminous research career in immunology in both Europe and the United, and the United States. Currently, uh, Dan, uh, currently, Dan, uh, currently, Dan, uh, currently, Dan is a professor uh, in pathology at, at Harvard Medical School. Dan's research has focused on T cell immunity, uh, immunity and autoimmunity. Her work over the years has helped to elucidate the molecular mechanisms and the cellular pathways of a T cell, uh, T -cell development. Uh, uh, tolerance, tolerance. In particular, Dan has discovered uh, master, re re master re re regulators that control uh, T cell tolerance in the thymus and has uncovered uh, 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 links among uh, metabolism, uh, commensal microbes, uh, regulatory T cells, and the induction, induction of, 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 of autoimmune diseases. For her outstanding contribution in, in uh, immunological research, she has been recognized with many awards and, uh, and honors, including the election into the National Academy, uh, into the National Academy of, of Sciences in the United States and the, and the German Academy of, of, of Sciences as well. So today, Diane will speak on air control of immunological tolerance, uh, uh, Dan. Yeah, I can see what David Baltimore <laughs> was talking about. Um, so I'd just like to start by saying uh, congratulations to the Cook Institute from uh, an admiring neighbor. Um, so uh, my title uh, was, um, is rather immunological, and I am, in fact, an immunologist. Uh, but as I'll go through, uh, I think you'll see that uh, of late, uh, we've been nudged into the cancer world. And I hope I can use this opportunity to interest uh, some of you uh, in future consults and collaborations because I know that there are uh, actually several labs that are interested in the molecular processes that I'll get to uh, at the end. <clears throat> so the focus of my talk today is a fascinating protein called AIR uh, which is the protein uh, encoded by the gene that underlies a devastating human autoimmune disease uh, called APSED or uh, APS1. Now this, is, uh, this slide illustrates what we now know is the major role uh, that AIR plays. And most of these data uh, of course, don't come from humans, but become fr come from uh, mice with an air knockout, which also have a, um, a severe autoimmune disease. So it turns out that there's a, a very small subset of uh, thymic stromal cells, making up less than 0.5% of the thymic stroma, that preview for differentiating thymocytes the whole world of proteins that they're going to see once they emerge from the thymus. So these are called medullary epithelial cells, or MECs. And it turns out that AIR is quite specifically, although not solely, uh, expressed in these MECs, where it induces the expression of a repertoire of transcripts encoding what we normally think of as uh, being involved in uh, um, end-stage, fully uh, uh, developed uh, peripheral uh, tissues, cells, and organs. For example, insulin or myelin basic protein. So AIR induces the transcription of these peripheral tissue antigens, or PTAs, uh, and uh, the transcripts get uh, translated into proteins, processed, and loaded onto uh, MHC molecules, 
And as the differentiating thymocytes are uh, percolating through the thymus, if their T cell receptor is able to recognize this MHC peptide complex in the correct window of affinity or avidity, this thymocyte will get super stimulated and will die by what we call uh, clonal deletion. Now, since the beginning, uh, since we figured out this function, the molecular mechanism by which air does this uh, has been uh, an interesting mystery. The primary issue is that you have this very rare cell type where air induces uh, the, or actually can also repress the uh, transcription of thousands of genes. And these are genes which in the periphery are, uh, have a di very different patterns uh, of expression, uh, both temporally uh, and uh, in different uh, cell types. And yet, air controls their expression in the medullary epithelial cells. And a related point is that if you express air ectopically, either in transgenic mice or uh, in uh, cells in culture, it always turns uh, up thousands of genes, but it's a different repertoire in every different cell type uh, that you um, introduce it into. So usually, there, if you compare any two lines, it's about 20 or 25 percent. So uh, over the past couple of years, our lab's uh, strategy for figuring out air's mechani mechanism of action it has been to perform two uh, broad uh, screenings. So one screening was designed to identify uh, proteins that air itself interacts with, either directly or as a member of a complex. And this is just done by um, standard um, co-IP MS uh, screening. And the second uh, approach was uh, an siRNA screening approach that we have been doing in collaboration with one of the programs at the Broad. Um, and we've set up a simple system where air can upregulate transcription. And we just ask uh, what hairpins are able to affect air's ability to upregulate transcription. And by now, we've screened 15,000 uh, hairpins and have some nice hits. So both of these pro approaches have give, given uh, hits. And not surprisingly, there is some overlap, but there are things uh, that don't overlap because the two approaches look at different things. Now, today, I'm just mostly going to talk about the first approach. And as I mentioned, this is a classical co-IP uh, MS screening approach where we have either HEC293 cells or 1C6 cells that are uh, a mouse medullary epithelial cell line. We transfect them with flag-tagged error or control run this out on a, uh, a loop, run, run this out on a gel, and then actually just cut every single bit along this lane and process it uh, by mass spec. Now, uh, we did this four times with the two different cell lines. And uh, we, uh, to make things make more sense, we set up a um, scoring system where we gave, of course, higher points according to the number of times it was pulled down and according to how good the peptides looked. And we, when we did this, we got um, a sort of unintelligible list uh, of genes, of proteins, which makes a lot more sense when you uh, organize them into related functional groups. So they fell very nicely uh, into four different functional groups. One uh, involved in nuclear transport, transport another in chromatin binding or chromatin structure, uh, another uh, c concern with transcriptional regulation, and another it with uh, pre-messenger RNA processing. So of course, we had to do uh, a number of validation ex experiments, which I don't have time to go into today. But I'll just uh, tell you, uh, we did things like do uh, reverse co-amino precip precipitations where instead of precipitating air, we would precipitate the candidate and make sure that air came down with it. And then we also did shRNA screenings, where for each one of our candidates, we took uh, five hairpins and looked at its ability uh, to affect uh, air's induction of transcripts. And when we did that, uh, we could validate 
about two-thirds of the candidate molecules. And importantly, we could find members of every single one uh, of these functional groups. So today, um, I'd like to focus on uh, two sets of interactions. One of them uh, is the fact that we came up uh, with um, several histones. And the reason we liked that a lot was that in um, other studies unrelated, both Andrew Coe from our lab and the Pedersen group had shown that AIR's, AIR has a PhD, and its PhD binds specifically to hypomethylated H3 tails. Now, Andrew was interested in this PhD1 domain here uh, because, as you know, uh, there has been emerging uh, stories about how PhD, different PhDs can be readers of uh, different uh, histone uh, sequences with particular modifications. So we collaborated with Orgazani at Stanford to do um, uh, uh, histone peptide, to, to probe histone peptide microarrays uh, with the PhD one. And uh, on these microarrays, we have all the different histones. And for each histone, we have peptides which span the whole sequence. And for many of the um, different peptides, we have different kinds of modifications. And so when we came in with the AIR PhD1, this is what we got. Um, the fact that we light up these sets of spots here uh, shows that whenever there's the naked H3 1 to 21 sequence, AIR binds there quite specifically. It doesn't bind to any other histones and any other regions of H3. And this set of uh, rectangles here shows you that um, when the amino terminal H3 tail is methylated on the K4 residue or the R2 residue, especially if there are multiple methylation sites, uh, air binds very poorly, uh, if at all. 